welcome to the Business of Betting podcast. Today I'm joined by Richard Munchkin. Richard, thank you very much for coming on. The Business of Betting podcast is proudly brought to you by the Betfair Hub from Betfair Australia. No matter where you are in the world, if you want expert articles from pro punters, from building automated models to betting psychology, check out the Betfair Hub. Betfair.com.au slash hub. Gamble responsibly. Today I'm joined by Richard Munchkin. Richard, thank you very much for coming on. Happy to be here. So Richard, many will know you from the Gambling with an Edge podcast, uh, which is obviously a fabulous podcast and many people have been listening in and following that throughout the years. Uh, and more recently, I got a chance to read Gambling Wizards and and obviously some, some great stories and information in there as well. Tell us a little bit about you first, and we'll, we'll get to some of the earlier days in a moment, but I'm curious how you would describe yourself or maybe someone close to you. How would they describe Richard? Oh, wow. Well, uh, so currently you're talking about, uh, well, I'm retired right now, so uh, from gambling, that is. Uh, although I, if I were to get the right phone call from the right people, I'm <laughs> sure I could be persuaded off the couch. But uh, I'm retired living in Las Vegas, and I'm kind of pursuing the things that I love to do, which um, COVID has put a damper in some and and actually been helpful in others. One of the things I'm really involved in right now is personal narrative storytelling. So if people are familiar with The Moth or other storytelling things, people get up and tell true stories about their lives. And so I'm really involved in that. And I do uh, theater. Uh, I've gone back to doing some acting, which is what my degree was in originally in college. And it's nice to be doing that without worrying about trying to become a star or make a living at it. I can just do it for the for the joy of doing it. Absolutely. No, and I, I think it strikes, you know, the question of do you think having all of those different outside interests help you as a gambler? Because, you know, I think I saw your IMDB page and, and some of the, the writing and directing and acting previously and obviously still going on to this point is that something that's helped you throughout the years to have a different focus or different passions even if you weren't actively directing or, or acting at the time but just keeping an eye on what's going on in the the movie scene and, and things like that well it it's helped from a number of things helped tremendously um that the acting of course because you're familiar with creating a character in the casino uh, some of the other things that helped me were I had an interest in magic uh, as a teenager, and that has been very helpful. The other thing that was tremendously helpful was after college, I became a blackjack dealer. I thought that the best way for me to learn how to count cards was to deal blackjack eight hours a day, and I could practice counting cards while I was dealing. And working in the casino, that helped me tremendously as well, because it gave me sort of the inside look at, at what was really going on inside the pit. A lot of times, blackjack players feel that everything that's going on is a reflection of them. And every time a pit boss looks at them or a security guard or whatever, it's because they know they're counting cards. And if you've worked in the casino, you know that 95% of the time it has nothing to do with you. And the pit boss is usually just thinking about which football game he's going to bet on on, <laughs> on Friday. So this was, I'm guessing this was after Beat the Dealer. So I think, what was that, in the 60s that came out or late 60s or something like that? So yeah, I'm, were... not, <laughs> I'm not that old. Uh, yeah, Beat the Dealer <laughs> came out, I think, in 62 or 63. And so I didn't get to Las Vegas until 77. And uh, so I, I started dealing in the end of, uh, actually in January of 78. And then I quit dealing in 82 and went to playing blackjack full time at that time. How good were you? 
in the uh, in that earlier period at counting cards? Was it something that you grappled with and understood very quickly and you were pretty good or was it a learning curve? I understood it um, very quickly. Uh, math was always my best subject in school and I was uh, making my living while, while I was in college, I was playing backgammon and poker in Chicago. And I met a dentist who was a backgammon player who told me he had just come back from Las Vegas and had a system for beating blackjack. And I was like, oh yeah, right, okay. And he's like, no, 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 this is serious. You know, this is math. And he told me about a book called Playing Blackjack as a Business by Lawrence Revere. And so I ordered the book. I had to special order it. And I read it and I was like, oh, you know, this is real. This is not, you know, some betting on lucky numbers or something. And I wasn't 21 yet. I was only 19 at the time. And so I started studying. And on my 21st birthday, my gift to myself was one of those uh, four days and three nights in Las Vegas, all inclusive. And I came out to Las Vegas and I really was not able to count cards yet. I just knew basic strategy, but ha being in the casino for the first time was not e able to count yet, really. So I just played basic strategy and I won a couple of hundred dollars on the trip. And I thought, oh, if I can win like this with just basic strategy, just think how much <laughs> I'll win when I learn to count cards. And so I, when I finished college, I moved out to Las Vegas and with the plan of getting the dealer. And um, I, I think I learned pretty quickly. I took to it quickly. But once I started um, on a team, uh, which we can get to in a minute, uh, I just could not win. I was losing for 160 hours. I kept thinking I must be doing something wrong. I would ask my teammates to go out with me to the casino and watch me play and see if I was making mistakes. And every time they did that, they came back and said, no, you're, you're playing fine. You know, it's just a bad streak. Uh, we know now that these streaks of 200 hours are not uncommon. Uh, counting cards, your edge is really small. So you can lose for a long time. But it was it it was uh, certainly disheartening, and I ended up quitting after after that 160 hours. I was like, "This sucks. I'm going, you know, I'm gonna just continue dealing." And um, you know, fortunately, a f one of the, my friends who was on the team with me, he joined another team, and they started winning like crazy. And he came back, and he said, "Look, you have to give this another try. You know, we're making money like crazy, and you know, just just try it again." And he convinced me, and so I did, and then I started winning and ultimately had to quit the dealing job because I was making more money playing than, than I was dealing. Were there many examples of teams like that who were just able to make a lot of money in that period of time, or was it still a bit of a challenge and there was plenty of obstacles even back then where it might not have been as highly scrutinized as it is today or the security cameras or all those types of things, but you know, it, it was still a challenge at that point in time? Well, the, the challenge back then, first of all, the, the card counting community was very small. So everybody kind of knew each other and there were several teams. And the challenge back then was initially the only place to play was Nevada. That was it. And then in 78 or 79, Atlantic City opened. But again, it, it was Nevada or Atlantic City and that was it. So if you became well-known in Las Vegas, it was very hard to be able to play unless you decided to go overseas or, or you know, wear disguises. I mean, we went through all of that kind of uh, malarkey as well. But uh, so th that was the biggest challenge. So there were pluses and minuses. Uh, one, you know, we had so few places to play, but on the good side, um, they took the action way better, just way better. Um, they would never dream of asking you your name or for your ID. You know, people wanted their privacy back then as gamblers, I guess because there was still a little bit of a stigma. So they would never, you could walk up to the cashier's cage, cash out $50,000, and they would not dream of asking for your ID. 
Also, the surveillance in many places was just non-existent. If there was surveillance, they would send a guy up into the ceiling who would look through a one-way mirror with binoculars. So there were no cameras, uh, or if there were cameras, they were horrible. They couldn't take your picture from up there and distribute it to all the other places. So often we would be told, you can't play here anymore on day shift and go right back in on the next shift and, and play again. Uh, that was, you know, not a problem at all to do that. So um, those were some of the benefits of, of playing back then. What about the benefits of the team? Because obviously it'll help smooth out those swings that you talked about a, a bit before. And there's obviously more capital to go around, for example, if you've got a number of people involved. But were there other things? I'm guessing it's probably a lonely endeavor, especially if, you know, you're doing hundreds of hours on your own and you may be uh, getting killed by variants at that time, even if you're doing the right stuff. But was there more to it for the team point of view rather than just the money? Well, yeah, as you say, it smoothed out the variance. And yes, the, the morale was better, right? Because if you were losing and one of your teammates was winning, you could you, you just felt better. And you had people to share the experience with, which I have said many, many times, if I had to play alone, I wouldn't play. I just, it, the... The last time I made a solo trip, I don't know, 10 years ago or something, I, I went to play a casino in Iowa in the middle of winter by myself, and it's just miserable sitting in these dumpy hotel rooms, especially if you've had a losing day, you know, eating crappy food. It's just horrible. So uh, I hated playing alone. Tell me how glamorous things could get, though, because it sounds like there's plenty of examples of even these days with people on the road driving from state to state, casino to casino, describing some of those casinos that, you know, we see the Cosmopolitan in Las Vegas, and then we hear about the stories of a uh, two-table, three-table, small casino on tribal land or commercial casino across the United States, and it doesn't always sound that sexy, but uh, certainly from an outsider's point of view looking in, it has that uh, aura of being a very sexy and glamorous endeavor. Yeah, yeah, which is just not the case at all. It just, it just is not. It's usually cheap hotel rooms and casinos. The first time I went to Macau, which I think was eighty six or eighty seven, literally people were spitting on the floor, including the dealers. <laughs> I mean, you know, hacking up phlegm and spitting it on the floor. Um, the dealers would. When it came time to shuffle the cards, they would pull up a stool and sit down and light a cigarette and take 15 minutes to shuffle the cards. So, um, you know, I've always joked that the worst casino in the world was uh, the Cal Neva in Reno because it, it, it seemed like they went 20 or 30 years without ever, ever changing the carpeting. And it felt like your feet would stick to the floor as you walk through the place. Um, it was about as dumpy as you could get. So, I, you know, I, I don't really remember any glamorous times. Uh, I mean, one of the things that we did back then, which was really not a good idea, is, you know, when you got a comp back then, there was no amount on it. There was no piece of paper that says you can spend $50. They just said, go to the restaurant and eat. And so some of the best memories of those times was being in steak in a you know nice steakhouse uh, at the top of Harris and Lake Tahoe overlooking the lake at sunset and having five or six of my teammates there enjoying a really nice meal and I, I remember I had a comp up there and at one point the one of the teammates ordered another bottle of wine and the mater d said I'm sorry I have to go down and check with the pit and we were like, check with the pit for what? And he said, well, you, you've already spent $3,000 on wine. <laughs> so, um, you know, and they called down to the pit and the pit said, yeah, give them whatever they want. And they gave us another bottle of wine. So, Wow. Not the same level of being discreet as, as many go to lengths today. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I would never do that today. <laughs> That's wild. So your network is is pretty famous in the industry obviously the guests you've had on the gambling with an edge podcast as well as 
gambling wizards and the names in that book. One I wanted to, to drill down on a little bit, if you don't mind, is Alan Woods. And plenty of Australian listeners would be familiar with that name as well as you know many gamblers around the world. But do you mind just telling us a little bit about your experiences with Alan uh, and, and how that went throughout the years? Sure. So when I was dealing, um, as I say, the card counting community was very small. <clears throat> and uh, a card counter came in and said, there's a card counter from Australia in town and he wants to play backgammon for a lot of money. And at that time, I, I was a very, very good backgammon player. And there were maybe 20 people I thought that I was not a favorite against in the world. And none of them were from Australia. So I, I said, you know, set it up for as much as he wants to play for. And he was staying at a comp at the Desert Inn. And so when I arrived, I brought two friends with me who were uh, also backgammon players from Chicago. They had moved out to Las Vegas. Uh, they had come to see me and never left, basically. And um, so we went to the hotel room and the player was actually a blackjack player named David Lang. But um, he was a former race car driver turned card counter. Uh, but in the room with him were a couple of other guys, and one of them was Alan Woods. And so when I got there, the first thing David says to me is, I've done some calling around, and I hear I'm outclassed. So I don't want to play for a lot of money. And we said, hey, you know, we can just play for small stakes and have a good time. And, you know, he was on a full comp. We'll order up room service. And and so we it became this party every day at the Desert Inn in this suite. We'd order up lots of room service and play backgammon for small stakes. And as I say, Alan was one of the players. And at the end of a week, Alan says to me, how come you you guys, me and my two friends, how come you guys aren't playing blackjack for more money? Because we were only playing for $5 chips at the time. And I said, well, we don't have a bankroll. You know, we're, we're just getting started. And so that's what we can afford. And Alan says, well, how about I give you $20,000 and you guys play for me? And I said, you've known us a week and you're going to give us $20,000 <laughs> to go gamble with and come back and tell you how we did? And he reached into his coat and he pulled out $20,000 and slid it across the table to me. And so I, oh, that is what turned me from an amateur blackjack player into a professional blackjack player. And um, so I owe Alan a huge debt. Now, uh, about six years later, uh, I was now playing full time. I was on a team and Alan was in Hong Kong, you know, working on the races with Bill. And he calls me up and he says, I have a blackjack play, uh, game for you to go play. I'll put up the money and you go play for me. And I said, well, look, I'm kind of committed to this team. I can't I can't play for you. I would love to, but I can't. And he said, well, how about this? How about the whole team can play this game? And whatever you guys were going to bet, I'll match it. And so I'll double your bankroll and you bet twice as much. And I said, OK. And it turned out to be this game in Seoul, Korea. And, and it was an advantage off the top. Even to a basic strategy player, you had an advantage on this game. And um, so we played that game. And we at that time, um, Japan was still in an economic boom. And all of their players were Japanese. And they got more action at that casino than I have ever seen in a casino in my life. And uh, I realized pretty quickly that as Caucasians, we would not get to play very long. So we recruited Japanese players to be big players for us. And we would bet the minimum and we would signal to the Japanese players how much to bet and how to play the hands. And um, after uh, our, our target, our win target was $100,000. And after Alan, um, after we hit that target three or four times, Alan said, look, uh, I feel bad about this. I've never made this much money doing nothing before. Uh, I don't want to, you know, take a piece of this 
anymore. You guys just continue on without me, which was very generous of him. Um, and and so, you know, we did and, and we did really, really well there in Korea. Um, and, and and I so the other thing, you know, Alan ended up in my book um, in uh, I think it was ninety nine. I was uh, flying over to Hong Kong to do some work for Bill Benter and who was one of my early teammates, by the way. And um, when I, I I was reading a book called Market Wizards, which was an interview with these uh, futures traders, commodities and futures traders. And I thought, man, these guys are boring compared to gamblers, you know. <laughs> so when I got there, I said to Bill, hey, I want to do a book like Market Wizards about gamblers. Will you do it? And he goes, no, nah. he goes, I, I don't want I, I, I can't do it. He goes, but I'm sure Alan will do it. <laughs> and so I called Alan and I was like, will you do the book? And he's like, yeah, sure. Come over. And so that's really how my book started. That's wild, wild stories there. Um, the, the interaction you described in the hotel room and the $20,000, is that something you've experienced over your career and over your life with respect to gamblers? Because I do think, at least in my experiences so far in life, that gambler to gambler, there is some innate, situation that that happens when you spend some time with someone and it becomes a pretty close bond and can happen relatively quickly compared to other instances obviously there's terrible stories and horror stories of of stealing and fraud and all those other things as well so maybe they counter counteract and counterbalance a little bit but is your experience that there are certain circumstances like that where there is a, a connection that can happen like that really really quickly without question and and you know going back to my book you know, Billy Walters, Tommy Highlands, almost everybody in the book says the same thing. Um, you know, Billy Walters said that he found gamblers to be so much more honest and um, and honorable than business people. Uh, to make that kind of deal uh, over $20,000 in the business world, you know, you'd need eight lawyers and it would take months hammering out the contract. Whereas, in the gambling world, it's pretty common to put a lot of trust in people and and trust them with large amounts of money. What was it about Alan or even Bill and those kind of guys that allowed them to do it so successfully for longer periods of time? Were they similar in some respects or did they diverge as well and they had their own nuance that allowed them to do it? You know, um, I mean, I have to give the credit really to Bill. Um, Bill was the one with the idea and, and Bill had more programming knowledge than Alan. Um, you know, so, uh, and, and I, you know, Bill, Bill is a very brilliant guy, but he also was in the right place at the right time. He was the first one to come up with the idea of beating horse racing using these models. And uh, I'm sure Bill would have been very, very successful had he gone into something else, you know, or if he had been born 20 years earlier, or 20 years later. Um, but, uh, but part of it, I think he, <laughs> you know, he just was in the right place at the right time. He came up with the brilliant idea at just the right time to have it. Tell me about your game playing. I think I've heard you talk about chess in the past and gin rummy. Obviously, you talked about backgammon before, poker and these types of games. Even, even let's say, back in the Chicago days, pre-turning 21 or pre-even 18, is that a good lead indicator that you are going to potentially be good at, at gambling-type games because of the you know, ability to play those games? And obviously, at, at backgammon, if you're talking top 20 in the world or, or even top 100 in the world, that's a pretty amazing feat. Are those the types of things that you can draw back on in your earlier days that have helped you propel into the, the AP stuff? Well, there's two things. Um, so I gr grew up outside Chicago where the winters are brutal. And so people played games just naturally, even, you know, the adults played games, <laughs> they played bridge or, or whatever. So I think to be successful at gambling, you have to have a bit of obsession with whatever form of gambling you go into. I've always said I'm not 
cut out to bet sports because I'm not really interested in sports. And if you're going to spend, when I was into backgammon, I played backgammon 12 hours a day. And if I wasn't playing, I was reading books about it. Same thing with poker. Um, and same thing with blackjack. It just consumed my life. And so I think having a love of games and that the challenge they present, I think, did lead me into gambling professionally. Uh, the other thing is you have to have some facility for math, I think, to be a professional gambler. Um, there are some people who basically have a mentor who tells them, okay, do this, <laughs> you know, especially people who are now playing slot machines for a living. If you have a mentor who says, play this machine at this number, well, then you don't need to have a much knowledge of math, but I, th I think most gamblers have some facility f with math. So the nature of these types of conversations generally leads towards highlights and leads towards great stories and, and things like that. For a moment, I'd just like to ask about the variance, the negative variance or the swings, the downward swings, because oftentimes a lot of the public discourse is about how good things are, but I'm sure there were times where things might have been tough or there were days or weeks or, or things like that where things weren't going well. Do you reflect on those times and, and learn from them or are they times where you'd like to forget and, and move on from? I definitely reflected and learned from them. So I told you I, I lost for 160 hours when I started counting cards and it taught me very quickly that the edge counting cards was too low. If you don't like long losing streaks, get a bigger edge. And so I immediately started striving to find ways to get a bigger edge than just counting cards. And, you know, if you listen to the podcast, Gambling with an Edge, we have had people on talking about how to beat almost every game you can possibly think of. Games that you could not imagine there would be ways to find an edge, like Keno or lottery tickets or, I mean, every game. Uh, certainly every game in the casino, there are people making a living playing slot machines now. So, um, so that's what it made me reflect on was, was how to get a bigger edge. And that was tremendously helpful because the losing streaks have been much, much less, um, you know, once I started playing with, with a higher edge. So you talked about the stigma in I think you said in Nevada or Reno uh, early on and you've been around the world can you tell us a little bit about how gambling at least from your point of view how is I guess treated around the world and and with that do you have to adapt to the local environment whether it's you know obviously in Asia they treat the idea of luck or or certain numbers very differently to other parts of the world and is that something that you would need to factor in as you went to all different parts of the globe to, to play these different games well, the biggest thing to factor in is that in many places, it is really hard for an American male to win money. Uh, if they're going to be suspicious of anyone, it's going to be an American, uh, a white American male. Just because it seemed like card counting started in America and whenever it spread, it was always Americans who headed out and then the casinos got burned. So they were very wary anytime an American showed up betting a lot of money. Uh, so yeah, that's something, and, and that's why we were able to be so successful in Korea was we knew that as Americans, we were not going to be able to win anywhere near the amount of money that we did if we tried to be the big better. But a Japanese player, it would take a long time. We played for over three years in one casino in Seoul. Yeah. And, <clears throat> and really, the only reason that it kind of finally ended was a degenerate player figured out that we were signaling to a Japanese player. And the degenerate player was also Japanese. And he approached our Japanese big player in the restaurant there and said, 
you know, hey, can you help me out? I, I need money, blah, 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 blah. And he wanted $10,000. And, you know, our player said, you know, no, I can't give you any money. And he said, well, what about your American friends? And he said, I don't know what you're talking about. And he basically tried to blackmail our player. He said, if you don't give, if you don't give me money, I'm going to tell the casino what you're doing. And, you know, he refused. And the guy went and ratted us out to the casino. And uh, so they came up with a, the, you know, the correct solution, which was bar the white guys. So, you know, I'm betting $5 on a table, never betting more than that. And I'm the one who gets barred and you can't argue with them, you know, so. A pretty bad beat. Having a degenerate blackjack player or a degenerate gambler find out your scheme after it's you been know working what? so well it's, for a number of years. It happens more often than you would think. Um yeah, they, I mean, people who spend hours and hours and hours in casinos, they just pick up on certain things. I remember one time we were in a casino and I was with a couple of teammates and we wanted to take over the whole table. We really wanted every spot. And there were two players that we were trying to get off the table. And the way that you do that is often you go in and you start playing crazy, splitting tens hitting 15 against a dealer six, just doing things that many superstitious players, it drives them crazy and they get up and leave, hopefully. And uh, one of the guys was going crazy about it. And one of us made some play like this, hitting 15 against a six or something. And the guy just kind of went off and he's like, I can't believe how bad you play and yada, yada, yada. This is absolutely crazy. And the other player and these guys were not together but the other civilian player says oh he says oh he knows exactly what he's doing he said these three guys are together and they're trying to get us off this table <laughs> and wow. you know now the three of us are all acting like we don't know each other and we're all like oh <laughs> shit <laughs> you know um but yeah the guy had just figured it out um it, Pretty it happens incredible. yeah yeah well i guess hours and hours and hours and those situations, you can find the, the little things. But tell me about the, the evolution of player versus the casino. And, you know, you talked a little bit about the earlier days where you don't even need ID and you can go cash out $50,000 potentially relatively simply to now where that's not necessarily the same. But how has that, let's say, relationship between those two parties changed over the years? Because I want to talk a bit more about Phil Ivey and a few other cases in more recent times. But was it always that way where it was combative or has that sort of changed as technology and the protection of the casinos against this type of stuff has evolved? Well, it was always combative. They were always barring you or 86 ing you. And I mean, in the old days, occasionally people got beat up, you know, and no lawyer wanted to take a case against the casino in Nevada because the casinos ran Nevada back then. Um, they still do to some extent, but not as much. And because of lawyers like Bob Nersessian um, and Bob Loeb, you know, there are lawyers now who can successfully sue casinos and, um, and, you know, things are changing a little bit, but they're still quick to bar you. One of the problems is um, the technology is so much better that they can get very good photographs of you and they will disseminate them to the other casinos. So it makes it harder. You know, I, I mean, this is another reason to play with a bigger edge is the casinos have figured out what card counting is. It, it, they're pretty quick to, to know if you're counting cards because it's pretty hard to hide it. So, um, but they really are in the dark about so many other forms of advantage play. Like, for example, Phil Ivey's case, where they let him win millions of dollars. And, and when I first heard about what Phil Ivey was doing, um, there is a casino consultant named Bill Zender, and he wrote an article about what Phil Ivey had done. And he didn't give any names. He just said, this play, you know, happened. And I read the article and I went, that is absurd. There is no casino in the world that would fall for this. <laughs> And then, of course, it, it, it turned out to be true. And part of this is because so many of the casino people 
they really don't understand the games anymore. You know, they're business people, they're MBAs and accountants, and they don't understand the games that they're dealing. So, yeah, they they are easier to beat in that way just because they don't understand the games. So, but now, I mean, people often ask me, do casinos cheat anymore? And my answer is that is the way they cheat. They don't pay you. So they don't they don't like take cards out of the shoe or deal seconds. They just, you know, they free roll you. They just say, we're not going to pay. Sue us. Yeah. Well, in terms of is it easier to make money now? Not is it easy? Is it easier to get detected or is it easy to get thrown out or is it easy to, is it generally easy to make money given of course there's advancements on the technology and the scrutiny side compared to previous decades um, but the the options are different like you talked about only having Nevada then only having Nevada and AC now there's hundreds of domestic casinos here in the US so there's thousands all around the world is it something that the challenges are just different the burdens are uh, not exactly the same, but overall it's it's a better environment now? Or would you say you'd much rather be, you know, back in the 70s and 80s and, and early 90s as opposed to today? So when I started playing in 1977, every year from 1977, I have heard people say, Blackjack is dead, you won't be able to make a living anymore, it's dying, it's over. And every year it just gets better. Um, Now, if you're a card counter, it may be not better. But if you're an advantage player, it is way better. There are so many more games to play, and the casinos don't have a clue that you're beating them. So, I mean, if you're good at your job, they don't have a clue what you're doing, and, and you don't get barred because they figure it out. Now, professionals get barred just for winning too much money. If you win, they will throw you out. And sometimes they throw out complete civilians who got lucky. But because they don't understand the games, that is kind of what they do now is just throw people out for winning. Um, But as I say, because there are so many more games to play and so many more casinos that it's way better. And it strikes me that that will continue because, like you said, you're not going up against a backgammon, gin, rummy, chess, poker player figuring out these games. You're going up against an NBA or a, or a machine or a robot, let's say, that won't have the same skill set as you and your AP colleagues have. Yeah. Interesting. Well, it's, it's a good... Bull- There's plenty of bearish cases out there as to why things are more difficult or, or all the problems that do exist. And you know, obviously, we have a, a focus towards sports and sports betting, and there's plenty of that. Uh, even horse racing, much the same, but it's... um. It's obviously a little bit different when it comes to different types of AP. And look at sports betting, right? I mean, now it's spreading all across the United States, so more outs is always good. And Absolutely, yep. So I want to talk about the Phil Ivey case, and there's another case that we talked about very briefly before we started where there was a, an unshuffled deck that was being played in a, at a blackjack table, if you can believe that. It must have been a... It was a Baccarat table, just, it not was a Baccarat? blackjack okay. table, but yeah. yeah. But in those examples, and you, you said before, you know, whether or not the casinos are cheating, but it strikes me that these things are going to just continue to happen because as people try and find more advantages or, or win more money, uh, these situations and scenarios are going to come up even more. And specifically on the Ivy case uh, in the UK, how did, where do you land on that line? Because I'm sure you probably think, well, you know, pay the player, you know, always side from that perspective. But being a little bit more objective, is there any reason or rationale why these casinos should be able to do what they're doing? I don't see one. Uh, to me, I, I blame it on the corporate culture. Uh, you know, it used to be that the casinos have a responsibility to deal the game and protect the game. That's their job. That's what they're there to do. And if you make a mistake, then, you know, you have to eat it, as far as I'm concerned. Um, the idea that Phil Ivey was cheating... He never touched the cards. All you ha- all the casino had to do is say, no, we're not going to deal the game that way. That's all. I mean, you know, any casino owner or manager that ha- knows anything about the game would take one look at that and go, that's ridiculous. Of course we're not going to do that for you. And 
first of all, I mean, the other thing that is doubly stupid about England and Atlantic City is Phil Ivey had already done this in a number of casinos and won a lot of money. And Bill Zender had written an article about it. Don't these people read anything about the business they're in? Don't they call anybody? I mean, it, it's just – to me, it's just absurd that they can get away with not paying just because, you know, hey, we were stupid. We shouldn't have to pay. It, 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 I Yeah, I just find it mind-boggling and offensive um, to call him a cheat for that. It's a big swing as well in terms of money based on the uh, – at least the case in the UK and the public information around – Oh, who yeah. was in the right, who was in the wrong, and, and so on. It, it it just sucks, especially from a gambler's point of view, about the, the free roll nature of a lot of this stuff. It, it seems like well, it, it may be one The other thing off. is it it has now emboldened the casinos to, to, to take on other cases where they just refuse to pay. So uh, casinos in England now, several of them have stolen players' money because they say – we are a private club. It's against the rules for you to count cards. So we're stealing your money. And that went to court in the UK and, and the casino won. It, it's just pathetic. So tell me about the Barona Casino in San Diego and obviously the, the Blackjack Hall of Fame uh, and, and what that means to someone like yourself who spent a career in this space. Well, the Barona Casino is one of the few casinos I'm aware of in the United States that actually is really doing things right. I mean, they understand that the casi- that casinos are a customer service business, so it's all about treating the customers well. And if you give them a fair game and treat them well, they're gonna they're not gonna go somewhere else. So they're tremendously profitable. And I think they did a brilliant thing, which is they found the best players in the world and said, we will give you comp for the rest of your life if you agree not to play here. You know, (laughs) so, um, you know, that has probably saved them millions of dollars over the years. So is that just inductees or is that a bigger group or a bigger selection? That, that's just people in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, okay. So anyone in the Hall of Fame can eat and drink and sleep as much as they want at that casino forever as long as they don't essentially take their money through playing the playing the games right. or card counting. Right. And yeah, golf, it's... too. I think it includes golf. Oh, there you go. I'm not a golfer, but... <laughs> so that is that successful because it's unique or is that successful because it's, like you said, taking care of your customers is, is obviously a number one priority in most instances but if you look at the broader industry even around the world the the i guess the nuance there is looking after your customers is number one except if they're winning and then we don't care well but they don't look after their customers you're, you're saying that they that they're losing I customers mean, i should say yeah i mean casinos pay lip service to the idea that they're they do customer service but just look at the way they treat their players it's you know it's uh a joke yeah and it's funny the the secrecy around the blackjack hall of fame um at least from the outsider's point of view it's, it's getting less and less with more articles and more information about it but some of those uh stories that do do leak out from some of those events and some of those people are, are pretty cool i'm guessing it's uh it's a bit of fun every year or every couple of years when you do head to those events oh you, you're talking about the blackjack ball um, exactly yeah 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 it's it's um you know a lot of people that go say it is the highlight of the year. It is. It's it's just a really cool event to be able to sit down with people like Ed Thorpe and Bill Benter and Jelko and you know. I mean, it's um, it's a really cool event. So I'm curious as to why you know gamblers are notorious for being very private and very considered about everything. So tell me a little bit about the the genesis of the podcast and obviously the book and being more public about some of the things that you've done over the years because like I said it's not a it's not a typical thing especially for the the very successful ones. Well, the book I told you how that came about. Um and you know, I wrote a book that I wanted to read. And the podcast I think is a really natural extension of 
what I did in the book, right? I love interviewing people. I love talking to people, hearing their stories. Uh, you never know what you're going to learn from them. And uh, so the podcast is a way to do that without all the work of writing a book, uh, which I you know, would never do again. I love having written a book, but it was so much work. It was worth maybe a dollar an hour to me. Um, so I would much rather just do this and sit and talk to people uh, and, and air it that way. I did not come up with the idea for the podcast. It's going to be 10 years. In a few weeks, we're celebrating 10 years of Gambling with an Edge. Bob Dancer came up with the idea. He had a different host for the first six months on a trial basis. He told the first host, uh, Frank Nealon, that they would try it for six months. And at the end of six months, Bob realized it really wasn't working with Frank. And he went to a couple of other people and said, I need a new co-host. And both of those people recommended me to Bob. And I had met Bob once or twice through Backgammon, but didn't remember him at all. Uh, He contacted me. I said, yeah, I'd like to do it. At that time, I was living in California, and the show was live on the radio. And so I was driving back and forth from California every week or every other week. And it just was too much of a grind. So after six months or so, I said, I can't do this anymore. Um, He got Michael Shackelford to co-host for, I think, a year. And then I moved back to Vegas. And I was like, hey, I can do this again. So, um, yeah, that's, that's really how the show has gone. But it's over 500 episodes now, and as I say, February 3rd, I think, will be the 10-year anniversary. That's awesome. And I'm guessing for someone who hasn't discovered it yet, there'll be a gold mine of, of different interviews and information to come. Do you have any that stand out from your point of view that may not necessarily be the most listened to or, or the ones that others might say, but from your point of view that holds a soft spot? Um, well, one of the best episodes ever, I think, is Kelly's son, who uh, is the woman behind the Phil Ivey case. She was the woman with him. Uh, she, that, she is a little bit hard to understand because of her accent. She's Chinese. But um, that was a really good episode. A couple of episodes that really I'm fond of are Billy Baxter, who is one of the old time sports better poker players with, you know, just tons of stories about Vegas in the old days. Um, So, yeah, I really like the Billy Baxter episodes. Um, There was one I listened to more recently in the last sort of 12 months. I think it was the guy, I think he was a lottery player and he figured out the lottery system basically and went to them and told them and they said, no, no, we're all good. Um, Yeah, right. We don't care. We don't don't care care. who wins the money. (laughs) It's a good yeah. depiction of what Actually, we were talking about before with the casinos as well. Yeah, those uh, we did two episodes with him. His name is Mohan Srivastava. That's right. I was gonna and, try um, it, but I didn't. I didn't try the pronunciation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those, yeah, those were good too. Um, because most people think you know you can't beat the lottery, right? Um, and any game you think that about, under the right conditions, any game can be beat. Now, you may not find the conditions often, but under the right conditions, any game can be beat. Yep, it's a good rule to live by. So one final question for you, whether it's you know younger gamblers who ask for your advice or or even just people who've been doing it for a long time and, and want a 2021 version from Richard Munchkin, what's some of the things you tell those people with respect to, to gambling? Is it more just the, the steady, sage advice of, of keeping your bankroll intact and stuff like that, or do you have more maybe more flamboyant ideas and thoughts and and advice for those types of people. So number one is it, the most important thing is your work ethic. How hard you work is how successful you will be. Uh, And, and the biggest overlooked factor, I think is the most second most important thing is your network. So, it's really, really hard to do this in a silo. And the more people that you meet and exchange information with and become friendly with, 
the better you will do. So, you know, I, I there just one example is is that story about Alan Woods calling me and saying, "Do you want to go play this game?" It's because he was a he was a friend. He was part of my network. You know. Um, so the more people you know that have that, but I mean, obviously it has to be a two way street. You have to be willing to give as well as to, to get. But um, so the more people you know and make part of your circle, I think the better off you'll be and probably the happier you'll be, at least for me. <laughs> so let's leave it there. We obviously just skimmed the surface. We could do hours, but Luckily for the listeners, they can go and check out your podcast and, and read Gambling Wizards and get, obviously, a lot more insight into into some of these things. But I want to thank you again, Richard. It's really a pleasure to, to talk to someone of your ilk about these topics. So thanks again for coming on the podcast. Absolutely. Happy to do it anytime. <laughs>